I remember what a newsworthy uh, event that was. There were reporters absolutely everywhere. There were literally several reporters crawling up the outside of the building to get photographs into the ICU. The technique of heart transplantation was always just a, it was a dream. The fact that you could transplant a heart from a dead person into uh, somebody with end-stage heart disease and basically give them a new life. That seemed kind of the stuff of myth or legend. First heart transplant in the United States was done in 1968 at Stanford by our fearless leader, Dr. Norman Shumway. Dr. Shumway was one of a kind, a real treasure and a joy to work with. At that time, heart transplantation was considered experimental. No insurance company would pay for it. It was supported by grants from the National Institute of Health. So we had actually about a decade of time to be doing the lion's share of all transplants in the world and uh, basically work out some of the bugs. Looking back, it, it, it may seem that everything happened at once, but in fact, the transplant, the, uh, the era of modern immunosuppression, the, the advent of the heart biopsy, and then other advances did occur over time. And through a strong research team that included Edward Stinson and many others, we ushered in the use of cyclosporin to heart transplantation. And with that, we began to see more and more people survive after heart transplantation. That moment and then the field that subsequently grew uh, out of that moment have just revolutionized uh, the prognosis, if you will, for people dying of end-stage heart failure. I started noticing symptoms of heart failure and arrhythmias that they weren't able to control. All of a sudden, this California dream that I moved here with turned into a nightmare. And it wasn't until I did research on where to be listed for heart transplant that I realized I was now living in the best place in the United States to receive a heart transplant. I had no energy. I could barely walk from one room to another in my house without getting out of breath. You know, the heart not only is the center of the body in so many ways, but when the heart fails, all the other organs fail. And so when patients have heart disease, their quality of life is just so terrible. Before my transplant, my baby was four months old and my money energy was so low that during the day, I had not even energy to play with her or just um, be 100% with her. I always think back to my boss in Chicago who trained me, who always said, that we never transplant a person, we end up transplanting their whole family because it's a typically a chronic illness that affects their caregivers at home, it affects their kids, it affects their loved ones. I remember I was 10 days post-transplant and I was able to take my first shower. And when I got out of that shower, I didn't have shortness of breath, I didn't have chest pain. And in that moment, 10 days after transplant, I felt better than I did for the years prior to transplant when I was waiting. People say, I want to get a transplant so I can see my grandkids grow up. I want to go travel. I want to skydive. I never had the courage to do that before, and now I get to do that. So when I got pregnant, I went to my doctor, Dr. Sharon Hunt, and I said, can I keep it? And she said, I don't know, but we're going to find out. And she said, you know we're going to have to work for it because, you know, this is our first. And I said, I'm willing to do whatever you we could do, but I just want one baby. If God has given me this baby, I just want one baby. I have always had a lot of energy. I, I'm always doing some kind of fad exercise, like I did jazzercise for a while, I did Taibo for a while, um, and my current thing is running. But um, I also like to, you know, use my heart to its fullest potential. Months after transplant, they are difficult, but life was becoming more normal every day. So it was baby steps for Clarissa and for me. I'm very proud of the fact that, that Stanford's kept up this standard of care, and I hope it 
stays that way for a long time. It's set to do that. There'll be 100 years of Stanford transplants. We're somewhat victims of our own success because people hear about kidney transplants and liver transplants and even heart transplants, and people do well, and it's been around now for 50 years. And so I think there's a tendency to think it's not the new thing. We figured everything else out. I think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of the medicines and decreasing complications and making sure that we're not doing things that decrease their quality of life. I usually talk to my transplant coordinator about scheduling, and I used to always joke with her that when you think about scheduling my appointments, think of it as, no offense, but I want to spend the least amount of time as possible at Stanford. There is a rich legacy at Stanford for developing pioneering techniques. We have to work hand in hand with our cardiology colleagues to care for the patients. No one person can be so good at everything they do to make it happen on their own. It really takes a village. Finding a, a way short of the biopsy to very accurately diagnose rejection is one of our holy grails. Imagine you're a heart transplant patient and you could just put a little drop of saliva on a device and it will be able to determine the genomic components in that saliva and then give you a, an indication of what medication to take. A lot of the work we do in heart transplantation focuses so much on the recipient and not as much thought is often given to the other half of the equation, which is the donor. And I think that really spurred a lot of my research, which focuses on ways we can improve the availability of donor hearts for transplantation. When you go through your life sick and you do everything you can to be healthy, and unfortunately, sometimes everything you do isn't enough. So to get a, somebody else's heart from a complete stranger, somebody who doesn't even know you, there's no way you can ever put into words how grateful you are for that. When I think about um, the Golden Heart, the 50 year anniversary, I think how blessed I am to be part of the history of Stanford, to be that patient that has received um, the best care in the world. Yeah, I, if I had to say something to Stanford caregivers, um, all the nurses, all the doctors, just thank you for everything that you do. I wouldn't be here without you.